Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. So thank you for being here. I do want to start by saying, uh, well, first introducing myself. My name is Scott Glisson. I'm the director of choral activities at Cal Poly University. Um, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, before we start, I do want to let you know um, that the 49er game is on right now. And so if you want to leave, there is still time. But you got to go right now, OK? All right, nobody's leaving. OK. Well, don't tell me the score, because I'm taping it, OK? I'll be very upset. All right, but anyway, uh, that has nothing to do with tonight. Tonight we're gonna talk about um, a little bit of everything. To be honest with you, um, when you're coming up with a lecture that's kind of um, up to you, what you're gonna talk about, because often it's, we want you to lecture on this specific to topic, but you know, David and I kind of choose our own adventure when it comes to this type of thing. And I thought, what am I gonna talk about? Um, because we're doing two different pieces, they really have no connection necessarily in terms of the composers. The composers did not know each other, probably. Um, and there's not a ton of connection. The, the language is not the same. The country is not the same. There's a lot of things that are not the same about this text, but the one thing that is the same is the text, is the actual origin of that text. And so I thought, you know, do I want to get really specific into one thing, or do I want to kind of give a general overview? And I opted for the, the latter, because I thought kind of the intent of tonight and why you're here is to kind of whet your appetite for what you're about to hear. The two pieces that you're going to hear on tonight's concert are not two pieces that you often hear, frankly, either one of them. Um, you're more likely probably to hear the Bach than you are to hear the De La Lande. Um, if you're like me, uh, you've never heard the De La Lande live. <laughs> Actually, this will be the first time, and I happen to be conducting it, which is fun. Um, but they're both kind of off the beaten path type things. But it's likely that you have heard the origin of this text, and probably some other settings of this text you might have heard. So uh, the reason that this lecture tonight is called this talk, we'll say, is called Out of the Depths is because that is the colloquial name for the psalm that we call 129 or 130. Uh, so Andrew, if you could, next slide. We have, I'm gonna say next slide a bunch because we don't have a clicker that works with the things there. So, you know, it'll be a little of that. And I may do a little of this too because I'm realizing my eyes are not as good as I thought. Um, so par pardon me for, for turning around. So yes, so, First, when we talk about this particular text and we talk about the settings of that text, we should first talk about what its origins are. And it is a psalm, okay? So Psalm 129 or Psalm 130. Now, why the different numbers, you ask? It's a pretty simple reason. And the reason is because, generally speaking, groups of people use two different numbering systems. Uh, Catholics tend to use the system that is more rooted in, uh, in the Hebrew numbering of those. And then Protestants tend to use the one that's more numbering on the Greek side of those. So all that is to say, if you see 129 or 130, they're the exact same psalm. It just happens to be what Bible you're looking in when they're numbered like this. This is also the reason that if you look at the cover of the De La Lande, it says it's a setting of Psalm 129, De La Lande being Catholic, working in Paris. And if you look at the cover of the Bach, guess what? It says Psalm 130. Bach being Lutheran, working in Germany. So just an interesting side note. The text itself, we talk about what is a psalm. We should probably start there before we get into how it's set. We all kind of know what a psalm is, but we don't always have a good handy definition for it. So let's start at the beginning. Essentially, a psalm is a text that is found in the Ketuvim, which is a portion of the Hebrew scriptures. Now notice I didn't say the Torah because it's actually more specific than that. The Torah is a specific part of those scriptures and the part that we're talking about are the Psalms. And we know these as well, um, even if you don't happen to be Jewish because they're also in the Old Testament portion of the Christian Bible. Um, they are traditionally thought to have been written by famous figures, most commonly King David, 
King Solomon, and then even down to Moses and all the way down to other very uh, big figures in Judaism. Um, but the sort of scholarly idea is that it really is a collection of authors that we're really not sure exactly who wrote them, but they were collected over a long period of time. Okay, so this is a very old text, wherever it comes from. Um, the word psalm, the etymology of that word, actually comes from the Greek word psalmos, which means literally to play with a harp. And that's a strange sort of thing because we don't often, you know, especially in, in the year 2022, when you come to church, if you, if you do or have ever been, uh, you probably hear psalms being spoken, right? And unless you go to um, Catholic mass where it might be a very high mass, you're probably not going to hear it being sung. They're spoken. But psalms were originally, even the word psalmos means to be musical, means to sing. So these particular psalms all have musical um, connotations in them, some more than others. Uh, go ahead, Andrew, next slide, please. So how far back does that go? We always get the question, um, or I always get the question, when did singing start? <laughs> the answer is we don't know, but it's always been around, right? And there are evidences of singing, and particularly singing psalms are some of the earliest evidence of singing that we have, period, in the world. And we see these things in the, the Bible. If you open up to the Old Testament, you see things like sing to the nor Lord a new song, which is, by the way, a psalm. <laughs> That's the text of that. Um, and these things date all the way back to at least the second century BCE, but we know probably much before that. Some other characteristics of a psalm. They are monophonic. And by monophonic, that means that there are not multiple voices happening at the same time. They're intended essentially for one person to sing at one time, okay? Um, this is an important point about a psalm, and it will make some sense when we start to talk about the way this psalm is set. Psalms, as I spoke at the beginning, as I began this talk, Psalms are Jewish texts. They are Hebrew texts. They were inherited by Christians, and one of the things that the early Christian church did was they wanted to Christianize these, uh, these texts. Now, I'm not using that in a derogatory way or a negative connotation at all, but that's what happened. Um, they wanted to make them relate more to the New Testament or Christian theology. And so what they did was they came up with these things called antiphons. And antiphons are simply a newly composed text. Often it's based on, on scripture, but it's a newly composed text that's intended to surround the psalm. So the way that monks for hundreds of years, have been thousands of years even, have been performing or reciting psalms is to start with an antiphon. Think of it as a bookend. An antiphon, the psalm, and then you repeat the antiphon. And the antiphon sort of influences, has sort of the same theme as the psalm. That's important when we start talking about this particular psalm coming in. There is an example of this, probably the most famous example of this. How many of you have ever heard a requiem before? <laughs> Everybody pretty much, right? Th this is the most famous probably example of this type of psalmody. Um, so Andrew, would you play a little of this? This is a chant. This is the chant from the Liber Usualis. <laughs> Would you pause it for one quick second, Andrew? So what you just heard right there, that's the antiphon. Now if we continue on, so if you would play a little bit more, Andrew. And 
and then it starts with the Requiem again, okay? So thank you, Andrew, great. Um, so, Requiem Eternum, then you have this portion, Te Decet Imnus, which is the psalm, and if you were listening carefully, you might have noticed that that portion of the psalm was less fancy. Did you notice that? It was more note, 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 note. Why is that? Because the psalm is longer, <laughs> and you have more to get through, right? You have a lot of text to get through. So that's the way that this works. Go ahead with next uh, slide, please, Andrew. Okay, so the question now comes to like, what psalms and why, if you know anything about psalms, there's a lot of them, right? There's like over 150 of them. Um, so why would a composer set a music, set a psalm to music? Well, there's a lot of answers to that. Um, the most obvious answer is the function of it, right? So when you're dealing with composers um, that are working perhaps more attached to, uh, to the church and things like that, then obviously they're gonna set psalms for that particular date. We know that Bach did this, obviously, because he would write things for particular Sundays, um, and those particular Sundays had prescribed text for those worship. De Lalande, as we'll discover, also had to do that because he worked for the king, and the king would have mass on a certain day, and they would have to have that particular text. But there's more than that, right? We know that it's more than that because a composer like Bach or a composer like De Lalande, as we'll discover, doesn't have the time to put equal amount of effort into every piece that they would write, right? It's just not possible. That's why some of their pieces are more famous than others. And why would people be gravitating toward this particular song? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. It is because the text is interesting. That's why, and if you've ever thought about why are there so many requiems? In fact, I have had students that literally don't like know what a requiem, they don't know the difference between a mass and a requiem because they hear so many requiems all the time that they just think that that's like the normal thing that happens every Sunday, right? Okay, because it's so popular. Why is it so popular? Because everybody's obsessed with death, kind of, but also because it's just this wonderful, like text is so it's so much imagery in it. It's got fire, it's got passion. So some examples of, uh, of, of psalms that are commonly set. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is very commonly set. And you probably, if you're like me, you hear this and you immediately hear the John Rutter theme uh, from, from one of his requiems, a very famous setting of that. Um, I lift my eyes to the hills, another very common psalm set. Psalm 150, praise the Lord with insert instrument, harp, <laughs> timbals, all this stuff, cymbals, all that stuff, like talking about music. So obviously the psalms that, that talk about music directly are commonly set. Next slide, please. So now we get to Psalm 129 and Psalm 30, and those are the, once again, those are the same psalm that we're talking about. This psalm is what you're gonna hear tonight in a variety of ways. It is one of what we call the penitential psalms. Um, it's called the Penitential Psalms because it has these themes of penitence, sorrowness, uh, repentance, generally speaking, being sorry for what we have done um, in the sight of God, which is, which is the text uh, here. Um, so in the Catholic Church, this particular psalm is used at several times throughout the year, um, but most notably, it happens during Lent, in the period of time leading up to Easter, which is a period of time of repentance. In the 18th century, this is an interesting thing, and it's very important when we get to talking about this particular psalm that you'll hear tonight in the French piece. Pope Clement XII, popular name for popes, in case you were wondering, um, established the tradition of praying this particular psalm, Psalm 129, Psalm 130, at evening prayer services that were intended for the repose of souls that were in purgatory. So why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because the Requiem text that I just played for you has absolutely nothing to do liturgically with the psalm that we are studying tonight. Psalm 130 is an Old Testament, it has nothing to do with the Requiem at all. But yet, when you hear the Delalon tonight, you will hear it end with requiem eternum dona eis domine et lux perpetua luce et eis. 
Why, right, why? Well, there was a tradition of this, and it just kind of evolved over time. They would have these evening prayer services, and since they were praying for the repose of the souls of the people who have passed on, it makes sense to attach requiem text to that. So that became a tradition that is not at all liturgical, but just absolutely just part of practice. So commonly this text is referred to, if you are speaking Latin, as De Profundis, which is the name of the De Lalande piece that you'll hear tonight, or Out of the Depths, which would be a rough translation in English. Next slide, please. So this is the text itself. Um, normally, I would save time and not read this, but since you are going to hear this text a lot tonight, um, you're not, you're gonna hear it, but you know what? You're gonna hear it in German, and you're gonna hear it in Latin. You're not gonna hear it in English. <laughs> so assuming we all speak English, it might be nice for us to listen to this just real quick, it's pretty short. So, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thy ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who should stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that, they, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait for him, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, you will recognize the word Israel tonight, many times. Let Israel hope for the Lord, for it is the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. When you hear the word Israel tonight, please know that essentially speaking, both Bach and De Lalande are referring to Israel kind of as a metaphor for us, for everybody, because in this, in this, sex, in this uh, sense, it means everyone. Okay, so next slide, please. So there are several famous settings of this text that you may know or may not know. The one on the right, you're more likely to know. But I wanted to play a, little ex a couple examples of other settings of this text so you know how old this tradition is. The example that we're gonna hear on the left is by the Renaissance composer Josquin Dupré. Uh, so one of the first kind of cosmopolitan composers that we know of, worked in uh, what we would say as present Austria and Germany and also France and also Italy. Um, this is a Renaissance setting of this particular psalm in the form of a motet. So could we listen to a little of the one on the left, please, Andrew? All right, I think that's good, Andrew. Thank you. Okay, so before I ask you, because this is the teacher in me is gonna make you guys answer questions. Um, but before I do that, uh, I wanna play a little of the one on the right. Um, the one on the left, Josquin, uh, if, if, if you want kind of a handy dandy date, think 1500s, think like late 1400s, early 1500s. I don't know the exact date of this motet, but those are Josquin's dates. The one on the right is by John Rutter, who's still alive. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this is the second movement of John Rutter's Requiem. Again, using this text in a Requiem setting, not liturgical, but commonly done. We may need to turn it up a little bit.
good. Thank you, Andrew. It's beautiful, but unfortunately, that's not the piece for tonight. <laughs> um, so my question to you is, what are the things that are in, in common with those two things? I mean, they could not be more different in terms of musical style, uh, in terms of era, certainly. But what are some things that are the same about those two different settings? Humor. What about it, would you say? Let's just be more general. Let's say, like, what's the feeling of both of them? Calming. Calming, okay. Somber. Somber, right? They're both in what we would kind of loosely call minor key, right? They're, they, they feel kind of lamenting, don't they? They have a heaviness to them. You may have noticed, or, uh, in perhaps subconsciously, that they are often both set very low as well. The first piece, certainly, you hear the bass is way down there in the basement. In the second piece, you heard a cello kind of droning away on the bottom. There's this idea of, of lowness and depths. And that makes complete sense because the text is all about out of the depths we cry to you, right? So they have that kind of, that mood that is set in both of them. And in tonight's pieces, you're gonna hear, we're in the Baroque era of music, and that's one of the biggest differences I'd like you to be listening for tonight when you come to the concert, is the differences that the two composers treat this text. Same sort of, same text, tre treated very differently. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna come to a guy that you probably never heard of. <laughs> And maybe the reason that you're sitting here right now, because <laughs> you're like, who is this guy, right? So the first thing is, his name is actually pronounced Michel Richard de Lalande. That is how you would say that in, uh, in French. So if you want to be really smart, don't call him Michael, call him Michel, <laughs> okay? Because that's the French pronunciation of it. Um, he lived from about 1657 to about 1726, so if you are a Bach scholar, you will note that their dates do overlap, but he's a little earlier um, than Bach would be. Bach was born in 1685 and died in 1750. Um, but, as I was mentioning, they likely did not necessarily know of each other or know each other at all. I'm guessing, I don't know that for sure, but de Lalande lived his entire life in Paris and in France. Very, very closely attached to the king, uh, the sun king, King Louis XIV. So, um, I'm going to give you just the, the, the bullet points here, and to be quite honest with you, there's not a whole lot of scholarship on de Lalande. There's kind of surface level stuff, so maybe one of you will write a book one day, that'll be great. Um, so, anyway, he had a lot of folks in his family, he was one of 15 children. He was indoctrinated into music very, very early on. There's lots of uh, very famous, well not famous, but well-known documented quotes about him having a beautiful singing voice and being a fantastic uh, harpsichordist, um, so that we know, and also violinist. So kind of the staple instruments for the day that you would study, violin, keyboard instruments, and a singer. Um, his, he, from very early age, in his teens, he was already working at very prestigious churches in Paris as an organist. Um, he ended up being married to an opera singer, uh, and both of his daughters actually were much more famous than him. They both became very famous singers um, in Paris of the, at the, uh, in the next era. Um, so, in 1693, de Lalande, through his kind of growing popularity, finds himself established in the Chapel Royale at the court of King Louis XIV. Now, there is uh, this, essentially, the Chapel Royale is the musical establishment for the king or queen. Um, there is an exact sort of equivalent to this in England as well. Um, where you say the chapel royal. Um, and that is essentially, it, it doesn't mean a literal space. It means any space. So if the, if the King Louis was in Versailles and was putting on an opera, that was the Chapelle Royale that was putting on that opera. If King Louis went on a road trip and went to Germany on a visit and his music musicians came with him and they did a concert there, it's the same place, it's the same group. Same thing with the king and queen, and by the way, um, some very famous composers were a part of this particular group of, of, of folks. Lully, uh, loosely Rameau, Charpentier, and the English equivalent, Thomas Tallis, William Byrd, uh, lots of very famous folks um, in this time period working for famous kings and queens. So, um, it was an important position, needless to say. And if you know anything, has anybody been to Versailles? 
So if you know anything about Versailles, it's not understated, right? <laughs> so this is a king with tremendous wealth, right? I mean, this is, frankly, the reason for the French Revolution, right, is this period of time leading up. Extravagant wealth. So you can imagine that the musicians here were well-funded, well taken care of, and had a lot of music to write, right? So just that's an important thing to know as well. In 1714, he actually finds himself the music director for this, un this ensemble. So it's a very prestigious position at that time. Um, and chamber music composer as well in Versailles. He took this position from Lully, who Lully is perhaps the most famous French composer of this period, uh, most known for his operas and Grand Motets, which we'll talk about in just a minute, also very famously known for stabbing himself in the foot and dying of gangrene. So he's one of the only composer uh, conductors that I know of that actually died during the art form. Uh, I hope not to repeat tonight, right David? I'm gonna try to get out of here alive, but we're not gonna be pounding on the ground unless something really bad happens. Um, so in 1726, uh, he passed away and he is buried at Notre Dame in Versailles. So not Notre Dame, there's a million Notre Dames in, in uh, France, by the way. <laughs> so just the Paris one is the one that's the most famous, but he's buried in Versailles. Um, so even in death, very closely attached to that court. Next slide, please. So de Lalande is mostly almost exclusively known for his grand moté. Um, we would see that in the word that we use, our pronunciation is motet. They would say moté, it's basically, it means, well, okay, now we're going down, let me not get into the weeds too much here. Um, I wanna talk about two different types of motet. I wanna talk about grand moté, because I'm gonna use that word a couple times, and then petite moté. If you think of a motet, uh, a motet is a word that we use in music circles that basically essentially means a piece of music in Latin, a sacred Latin text that is not part of the mass, okay? So kind of any piece that's in Latin, often unaccompanied, that's a motet as long as it's not part of a mass or some other large piece, okay? So that would be in France in this time period called a petit motet, a small motet. Okay, now a grand moté is a cantata. It's the same thing, essentially. It's the German, it's the French equivalent to what a cantata was, which means, essentially, that it has multi-movements. It's separated into sections throughout. It's not through composed, and it's often longer. Probably contains instrumentalists, probably is more grandiose in nature. Again, hence the word grand moté. So that's what we're talking about. So just know that when I say grand moté, it's the same thing as a cantata, essentially. And in that way, the Bach piece that we're doing and the Stella Lande are essentially kind of the same functional type piece. They have the same sort of like backbone in that way. Um, so a very important thing happened in 1689. In 1689, King Louis XIV said to de Lalande that he was allowed to publish all of his Grand Moté. This may not seem like a big deal to you, but in this time period, you have to remember that these composers and these musicians were in the service of the king or queen and could only do what the king or queen said that they could do. This is kind of famously the case um, a little bit later, maybe 100 years later with Haydn. If you guys know anything about Joseph Haydn, he wasn't able to publish his own music until the Esterhazy family gave him permission to do that. It's kind of a similar thing and this kind of made de Lalande important, kind of boosted his uh, position in society. Um, and one of the most popular grand motets that he published was in fact S23, that's his numbering system, uh, De Profondis, which is the piece that you will hear tonight. Next, please. So music at the court of Louis XIV, very quickly, um, it pretty much, if you think Versailles, if you have a mental image, you're probably thinking things of gold, you're probably thinking of big spaces with lots of mirrors and shiny and ornamented and ornate. And that is what you're gonna hear when it comes musically as well. They are very similar. Some other things uh, to kind of put yourself in the, mind, the mindset and the, in the mental image of the court of Louis XIV, um, this group, the, that word uh, basically translates to the 24 violins of the king. Um, this is a very famous uh, 
group that was, as it's pretty self-explanatory, <laughs> 24 violins and also some other instruments as well. Um, but they were part of the chapel and that's excessive, isn't it? 24 <laughs> violins, you know, to follow you around and play music for you as the king, that's a pretty, that's a pretty nice gig. Um, gallant style. Um, by that, I use that term loosely, but by that I mean it's light, it's elegant, it has kind of a bounce to it. It perhaps is, uh, well, it's in stark contrast to a more serious Baroque style. One of the things when you listen to the Bach tonight versus the De La Lande is that you will notice that the Bach kind of doesn't have as many moments of brevity in it as the De La Lande does. It's pretty much, would you agree, David? I mean, it's pretty serious throughout, right? The whole thing is kind of gravitas. The De La Lande has his moments that are very dramatic, but then there's these moments of kind of little, you know, frilly and dance-like things that you'll hear as well. There is almost no such thing as music from the time period of King Louis XIV that does not incorporate dance of some type. It was, it's kind of a running joke now, but it was very much true that in every French opera you ever see from the Baroque era, there's a full-scale ballet in the middle of it. Doesn't even matter if it has anything to do with the plot. There's a full-scale ballet that happens in the middle of it. French ballet itself is French, right? I mean, so the French in the Baroque era have a very strong interest in dance, a very strong interest um, in ballet in particular. Um, and also, one other feature of music in this time period is it's highly ornamented. Now, so ornamentation is essentially, and you guys probably know this, but just as a little, you know, side aside here, um, you know, to ornament a melody is to just make it more fancy. And the word Baroque even itself translates essentially to ornamented, loosely. Okay, ornamented pearl is what we talk about, you know, Baroque era pearl. But to ornament something is to take a normal passage and make it fancier. Right, so I'm just making something up on the spot. But you just take the root, you take the, the basic melody and you add a bunch of stuff around it. Now, one of the first things that I noticed when I cracked open this uh, De La score, and probably every person in, that's performing it tonight noticed as well, is that there are plus marks all over the score, everywhere, just plus marks everywhere. That's indicating ornaments. And the crazy thing about that is, that's not even all of them. That's just the ones that, that they put in. It was expected that folks would have done more than that. So there's almost not two measures, I'm gonna say, that are gonna go by tonight where you're not gonna hear somebody trilling or doing something that's totally different than just the basic, basic melody. So highly ornamented music. Next, please. De profundis, and notice I'm using a French uh, Latin uh, pronunciation of that. That's also another thing that you'll get the pleasure of hearing <laughs> tonight. Uh, we are using French Latin pronunciation tonight. Uh, French Latin is uh, a no whole another subject for another date. It's a lot of argument about what it actually should be and what it was and all that type of stuff. But just to say, basically, if you speak any French at all, you look at the Latin word and you kind of pronounce it like it's French. <laughs> so. What we would say in Latin would be de profundis, uh, and in French Latin that would become uh, de profundis, essentially, because it becomes you know, nasalized and stuff. So you'll hear those sounds come out tonight, and it really gives it a different character, and you can start to put yourself in that place. The de profundis is in nine sections, as I said, a cantata-like structure, so it's multi-movements, it's in nine sections. It is in Latin, as I mentioned, that makes complete sense because, as you probably know, uh, France still even, but especially in the time of King Louis, is very Catholic, so everything is still in Latin at this time period. It's a combination of arias, recitatives, and choruses, though you will not hear any recitatives in the style that you are used to hearing tonight. The one piece that he calls recitative, which the tenor will sing, is basically an aria. So you'll hear, it pretty much just refers to like lightly orchestrated with continuum. SSATB, that means double soprano, that's very common in the Baroque era and especially in French. And one thing that I wanna highlight to you, and this is a unique thing that these two pieces share, is this French Baroque orchestra. Now what does that mean, you ask? 
it really just kind of means one thing. Their viola section is divided into two sections. When we think of a standard orchestra nowadays, we, don't, we think of violin ones, violin twos, violas, cellos, and basses. In French Baroque music, the, vi the violas were divided as the, vi as the violins are. So there were two, violin one, violin two, and viola one, and viola two. Um, interestingly enough, when we come to the Bach, you'll see what happens there. So that's that, and then continuo. And you're gonna see all sorts of fun instruments tonight. This is the harpsichord, right? So a plucked string instrument. And we have the organ, the portative organ. And then you will also hear a therobo, which is like essentially a giant lute. <laughs> Next, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna play you a couple of examples to kind of get this in your, uh, and I'm not gonna spend too much longer on this because it makes some connections to the Bach as well, but just some, some general themes that you will hear throughout the night when you listen to this piece, this De Profondis. The overall effect, we talked about this. Uh, out of the depths, this is not the concert for you if you came here li hoping for uh, the Hallelujah Chorus or something that was gonna have you kind of like, you know, walking out feeling like that was so, I mean, you're gonna be happy and you're gonna love the music, but it's not, there's gonna be a lot of minor keys tonight. That's what I'm telling you, I think, <laughs> okay? Um, so it's heavy. It's, a heavy, it's a heavy piece. And you'll hear that in the first movement and the last movement in particular. And then dissonance. Um, think of an organ. For, for example, um, if you have ever heard organs of different national, of nationalities, if you've heard an English organ or a German organ and then a French organ, a lot of times organists joke that French organs are basically out of tune all the time because French, the French have always, even in the Baroque era, really gravitated toward dissonance a lot. So French organs even sometimes sound a little crunchy. And you're gonna hear a lot of dissonance in the Delalonde piece tonight that is actually a little bit startling for this time period. Uh, so would you play just a little of that clip, Andrew? This is the first movement, everybody. some ornamentation right there. So I think in that little clip right there, you can hear just about everything that I talked about, right? The ornamentation, thank you, Andrew. The, let's not give it all away, then they won't stay for the concert. Um, so another interesting thing, the very first voice that speaks is the bass voice. And we talked about that when we listened to the other uh, few pieces. Again, this painting the text, this idea of crawling out of a pit is essentially what this text is, right? So the bass voice. Now, in the Bach, you will also hear a, you will hear the bass has a lot of material in this, right? An entire aria, my favorite movement actually, is completely devoted to the bass singer and a chorale. So yes, now the ornamentation, um, actually let's go to the next one because I think I talk about that. And that's another interesting feature of this uh, piece as well. Andrew, could we go to the next? Thank you, so, ah, there it is, okay. So, uh, ornamentation in Baroque music, ver in, sorry, in French Baroque music versus just regular ornamentation in perhaps Germanic uh, music or English music, it's a little different. As I said, the French like to ornament everything. They're fancy, again, think fancy. 
Um, typically speaking, if you're gonna ornament in the Baroque era, it often comes on what I would say the penultimate beat or the strong beat before the final landing point. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, it would be something like, you know, we're coming up on a... Right? So you got the... Cadence, right? Now, the French, one of the things that is really interesting about that, and when you sing it, it totally throws your brain for a loop, because they'll not only do that, they'll ornament the final note as well. And that's really crazy. So you'll hear that all over the place in this piece where we get to the final note and they're still trilling away. And that's, it's really exciting. It gives it a real kind of interesting uh, flavor. Um, not to like give away secrets, but the very last chord of the entire concert that you'll hear, I've added ornament in, so listen very carefully for the violas and the, and the altos. <laughs> so it may be something similar to what you just heard there. Um, this, this, other idea, there's some performance practice things that crop up in Baroque music that you'll hear tonight. Um, note en egal is how you pronounce that, and essentially that just means unequal notes. And so that's referring to eighth notes. Um, so if you look at one of the movements of this, you will see um, that it is scored uh, for, it's an oboe and, uh, oboe and solo soprano, and it has running eighth notes throughout the entire piece. So. That's not actually it, but I'm just giving you an example here. Let's just say that that's our passage, right? Ba da 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 da. Eighth notes, yes. Um, that's what it looks like on the page, just straight eighth notes. But the performance practice of the day, note and egal, unequal notes, would mean that you would actually perform it this way. Now, what would we refer to that nowadays? We would say they're swung. Right, it's kind of like a jazz thing that we say. Um, but that's all that means, and ways that you know, it doesn't say it in the score that you're supposed to do that, but ways that you could indicate, it's the overall mood of that particular uh, movement. And this particular movement actually notates at the beginning, graciously, that's what he says. And so you put all those things together and you say, he probably intends for this to have some graciousness and kind of be lilting around. And you can hear how that gives it a dance-like quality, right? So let's listen to a little of this. I believe this is that particular movement. So actually, before you do that, uh, before you do that, uh, Andrew, that's the line, right? So, and you're gonna hear her ornament that as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and listen. Baroque pitch. Okay, so you can hear a couple of things. First of all, you hear the ornamentation happen again. Uh, you also hear that if you look at the page, it's very hard to see, I realize that. But you see, it should just be in the bass part, ba, 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 ba. But instead, as you heard it perform, ba, 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 it gives it that lilt, lilting type quality. Also, this is in a major key. And it sounds like a dance, right? You could get up and waltz to this if you wanted to. Please don't tonight. Um, I guess you can, but. It's probably not COVID safe, so don't do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could get up and waltz to this. And that's a little funny, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about this very serious psalm that's talking about pleading to God out of the pits. But what De Lalonde does is because I told you, this French music, there's always dance in it. So you're gonna hear a variety of movements in the middle of this piece where De Lalonde has selected carefully text that on its own is not as heavy. Right, and he's using that as a moment to kind of give it some brevity. You will not hear that in the Bach. Let's go to the next uh, one, please. 
Um, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. They can, it's just more ornamentation. Let's go to the next one. Okay, now I talked about this at the beginning. I'm going to slide over this real quick so we can get to the Bach a little bit. Um, the use of the Requiem text. At the very end of the piece, um, he inserts the Requiem text. Now, he doesn't use it. Now, this is where I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little, I'm stretching a little here, okay? So if any of you are musicologists, I apologize in advance. But when you hear the beginning of this piece and you hear the ending of this piece, you cannot help but feel that they are mirrored in some way. It's not exactly the same music, but it is reminiscent of the beginning big time. The beginning of the piece is just the De Profondis text. The ex end of the piece, as I mentioned, is the Requiem text. But it does kind of feel like it's bookended by that. So it's kind of that practice of antiphonal psalmody as, as well. So I'm gonna skip this actually so I can get onto the Bach, um, but you'll hear it tonight, uh, this Requiem. Uh, text cropping into the end that doesn't belong in the psalm, but yet is here anyway. Okay, so let's just briefly, you guys are all Bach scholars, so I don't need to go into Bach too much. David, my colleague, did that beautifully uh, the other night. Um, but I will say just a couple of things to kind of put you in the mindset for this particular cantata by Bach. This is the first piece you'll hear in the concert. The Dead Alon is the last. What was Bach doing in 1707? Because 1707 is when this cantata is dated. Uh, Bach at that particular time was a young man working in Mühlhausen. Uh, that is kind of a famous map up there. I realize that's impossible for to see, uh, but you probably can see a little circled red dot there, and that's where Mühlhausen is. Um, that's where Bach was working at that time. He began the position at about Easter sometime around then in 1707. He actually got the position as a part of a little competition type thing that he was doing. Um, he was in Mühlhausen, the organist for one of two very important churches in town. It's kind of famously documented that the two pastors of the various churches did not like each other um, and were often quibbling and quarreling over certain things. Um, and you will notice that Bach left the position for Weimar in 1708. So he was a very short stop in Mühlhausen um, for who knows why, but it probably had something to do with the environment there. Um, so although he was not there for a long time, we actually get some very important works from Bach's output at this time. Two of those famous works, one you'll hear tonight, but two of the most famous cantatas period are from this time period, Chris Locke in Todes Banden. This, you guys have done this here before, right, as part of Bach week. That's a very famous cantata, chorale cantata. Every single movement is based on the same tune. Uh, and then Gott ist mein König, which is another one. Uh, also a very famous piece um, from the Mühlhausen time period. Next, please. So um, the, t the cantata that David is conducting tonight that you will hear, Aus die Tiefen Ruf uh, ich zu dir, Out of the Depths I Cry to Thee. Again, I've, we've talked about this. It's the same psalm. Um, set for SATB choir, violin one, two, viola one, viola two, oboe and continuo. So the performing forces are that French Baroque uh, orchestra. Now, if, you, if I'm making that sound like it's a really cool and unusual thing, it's actually not uncommon for, for Bach's early cantatas. Bach's early cantatas tend to have this French style orchestration. Uh, but it does pair nicely when you're putting the concert together, doesn't it? Because <laughs> you have the personnel. It's one of the few early cantatas that we have a reliable date. We, we don't know exactly why it was written, but we have a pretty good idea. And the reason we have a pretty good idea is because there was a devastating fire that happened in Mühlhausen right around this time period. Um, the, we believe that this was requested um, by one of the preachers um, that he would set this particular text um, as kind of a response to that fire in Mühlhausen. So, that's what we think anyway. It makes sense, right? I mean, this is the perfect kind of text to set when you're lamenting something terrible that has happened. Aren't you glad you came tonight? So uplifting, isn't it? Next, uh, oh, by the way, it's BWV 131, which is a little confusing because I've told you that it's Psalm 129 slash 130, and you might be thinking, why is it BWV 131? The BWV numbers have nothing to do with the psalm, they have actually nothing to do with anything except probably the order that uh, the person that was publishing them had them in, <laughs> except those are the cantatas in that area. Okay, so some various themes. Actually, before I talk about that, let's just listen to just a little bit of this 
Um, if you don't mind, Andrew, this is one of the movements of the piece. The first movement. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so clearly different, clearly different. Um, some things that you hear where you kind of know that it's Bach, you hear kind of that pleading oboe dissonance that happens throughout, that kind of like pervasive chain suspension stuff that's happening. But also another interesting point to bring out, I mentioned that in all of these pieces that are these settings of these psalms, there tends to be this kind of focus on the lower range a lot. Um, and if you look at just even the opening uh, motive of that, notice that he's not sending you to the highest note. He's sending you down each time. Um, and I think that that is a little bit of an homage to the text, a little way that Bach is painting that text. It gives that feeling of heaviness throughout. Next slide, please. Let's, uh, okay, I think that's the same one, isn't it? Yeah, we're gonna find out. Oh, no, it's not, sorry. So again, bass. Good, thank you, Andrew. Okay, so another kind of interesting uh, difference between the two pieces that you will hear tonight. You'll hear two different movements tonight in the Bach that both utilize this stylistic uh, compositional method. Bach does this a lot in a lot of different pieces. What he is essentially doing, the top voice here that's being performed by the sopranos is a chorale. Okay, now a chorale is simply a hymn from the Lutheran church, it's just a melody, and it's a melody that the congregation likely would have known. It would be as if I started singing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Most people know that tune. The congregation would have known this tune, and it's a way for them to kind of latch on and say, oh, I know what that is, that piece is about. That's what Bach is trying to do here, he's trying to say that through the chorale. Um, and then the bass underneath that. Delalon does not do that because in the Catholic Church in Paris, that the focus is not on these chorale melodies. It's still very rooted in this style of of, uh, of Catholicism and of chant. But you will hear lines that sort of allude to chant and kind of sound like chant. For example, Requiem Eternum has that kind of feeling to it as well. Next slide, please. As I run out of time. So it's just, th th this is stunningly beautiful. And it's just, it's again, you cannot help but feel the way 
almost every movement that he's just setting this idea of pleading, right, of just this, this longing pleading. Remember what the text is, remember why Bach composed this piece, why we think he did. Um, also, interestingly enough, the very beginning, it's a fascinating little opening, isn't it? Chord, 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 ba da 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 Like it's this just funny little solos that occur in there. To me, that's essentially kind of written out ornamentation is basically what it is. I mean, he could have set that a lot more simply, but instead it's all kind of fancy and ornamented. This is also very common with Bach. Bach, is, Bach was a teacher in many different ways that he did. And so when you look at a Bach score, he's not gonna leave a whole lot up to the imagination. For the most part, he's putting in what he wants. And a lot of times when you see Bach scores, you're like, oh my gosh, there's so many notes. Look at this Handel score, there's no notes. Well, that's because Bach's writing it in because he wants you to do it. Handel expects you to do it, he's just not telling you you have to do it. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Next score, please, uh, next score. Next uh, slide, please. You're out? Well, that means that's all I have to say, everybody. Um, yeah, sorry, no wrap up for you guys. It just abruptly ends. Um, but, what I, but to wrap it up, um, what I would like to say is tonight, um, as you take in these very different but strangely kind of linked uh, pieces, um, note a couple of things. One thing is that there's only 17 years difference between these two pieces. It's not a lot. So they really do come from pretty much the same time period in what we would say maybe the middle Baroque period. But they're very, very different in the way that they treat uh, the text. Um, Listen for the word painting. Listen for the way that each composer, follow with the translations, and listen for the way that each composer is trying to bring to life this text um, in, an, in an individual way. Listen for the moments that we kind of get a break in the, in the, in the heaviness, in the delant. And then notice in the Bach that you don't often get any breaks in that, right? And remember the function of what they were. Bach was writing his piece, this cantata, likely for a very somber event, likely for the folks in Mulhausen that were dealing with a very devastating event that occurred in their life, and it would have been a liturgical piece that you would have expected to be performed in a Lutheran service, probably, uh, I don't want to speculate what type of service, but some type of service. The de Lalande was likely intended, perhaps for a worship service, but more likely for the pleasure of the king and those around them. So thus, the function is different, the music comes out different. But there are these themes that run throughout of low penitence, this idea of crawling up out of the mire, or however you want to think about that. Um, we know that you're going to enjoy these two pieces. You're not going to get a chance to hear them, uh, I, I guarantee, a lot. The, the only reason that I know about this de Lalande is because at the University of Arizona, as a graduate student, we had this class that we took every single uh, semester called Choral Seminar. And it was basically the 15 or 20 choral majors, uh, graduate students that we had there, we had, you know, we would have a topic. And so that particular quarter was on, you know, requiems. And so every single person would present on a requiem. We'd go down the line starting with Akagem and go all the way to, you know, Penderecki and on. Um, and so, we happened to be talking about motets and we came across this and there was like this little snippet in there that we talked about this de Lalonde grand motet for like five minutes, maybe. <laughs> and it just stuck in my brain for some reason that the opening was just this incredibly beautiful thing. And sometimes that's what happens. Uh, and then it just blossomed from there. So we're very excited to uh, perform this for you tonight. And uh, thanks for coming and listening to me chat about it. Uh, we hope you enjoy the concert. So thank you all.
Good evening, everybody. We're excited to be here, too. Uh, my name is David Oribe, and I'm here together with Scott Clifton. We are the co-directors of Box Week. It's so great to have you here in person. It's also great, if anybody's watching on the live stream, that you're here, too. Um, we're totally excited to bring this uh, program to you tonight. Uh, the two bookend choral pieces are connected in a way that uh, Dr. Clifton explained beautifully in his lecture before the concert. And in between, we'll have a piece led by not a conductor, and not a conductor, but by our mu guest musicians themselves. So we hope you enjoy all three pieces. This is the culmination of a week. That's why we call this Bach Week. And we've had uh, lectures and master classes and an organ recital, and this is the uh, final shebang. How many of you were here last night to hear the guest artist play chamber music? Wasn't that fantastic? Yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, so this is the final concert. We hope you enjoy it. And uh, Scott, do you have any words? I mean, only to say that I think you just said I wasn't a conductor. I'm not sure if I had no, talked about <laughs> Just kidding. You, please laugh, because that was a joke. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're very, very happy to have you all here tonight. Um, as is no, uh, as is evidenced by the masks on our face, right? We're still dealing with uh, social distancing and all those types of things. So uh, on the second half in particular, when you see that most of the audience members will now be performing for you, uh, don't be sad by that. There's a lot of people watching on the live stream. We are capped at capacity. So congratulations for being here in person. But we are very, very happy to have you uh, watching virtually at home as well. I want to say one more thing about that. If you are at home right now uh, watching this wonderful concert um, that we have offered to you free of charge, uh, we would like to also acknowledge the fact that Bach Week uh, does require funding, and we do uh, appreciate any donations uh, you might be interested in making. Uh, there will be various times in the concert that things appear on your screen uh, telling you how you can support Bach Week, if that is of interest to you. And uh, I think that's all I have to say. Welcome, and we're excited to be performing for you tonight.
now tune the choir. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, we're going to get right to the music. Uh, I did just want to say one quick word about this piece. Uh, has anybody in this room heard uh, De Profondis by uh, Michel Richard de on live before? Exactly. Yeah. So great, you're about to. Um, that's <laughs> that's that's the reason I wanted to say one quick thing about it. Uh, put yourself in the mind frame right now of being at the court of King Louis the Fourteenth, sitting in Versailles with all the ma majesty and grandeur of that place, um, and then imagine the same text that you just heard set with Bach, now set in the French Baroque. So we hope you enjoy Michel Richard de Lalande's De Profundis. Thank you. 